Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us today for Forging Forward number 75. Hard to believe, but yep, the 75th show. Thanks again for all of you who've been with us, uh, some of you who may be with us for the first time. I am your host, Brian Crimmins, Global Managing Partner of 100 and CEO of Changing Our World, and thrilled to have back for at least the fourth, maybe the fifth time, Dr. Susan Raymond to uh, take us through and lead us on a conversation around how the current economy is impacting the philanthropic sector. So certainly I know a topic that is out in the news and uh, we're having a lot of conversations internally and externally with clients and people in the industry as well. And as, as I said, who better than Dr. Raymond to give us some perspective of what's happening and some of her thoughts about uh, what, what to do in an environment like this. Um, so without further ado, I just want to welcome Welcome, Dr. Raymond, back, and uh, really just start the conversation at a pretty high level. Um, Susan, just to, I'd love to hear you take us through what's going on with the economy, what's going on with inflation, possible recession, a lot of headlines, a lot of news, but if you would, tell us from your perspective what's going on. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here again. So 75, let's see, that's about as old as you are, is that right? <laughs> Close enough. Someday or half, let's see, it's twice as old as you are, maybe? Uh, <laughs> you're getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think, Brian, it, it's really important in, in times like this, you know, where there's a lot of volatility um, to have some perspective, um, to understand kind of what the, what the longer term realities are, because we always kind of live headline to headline. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to decision making, that's a really bad idea. So if we look at, let's take the Dow, for instance, we could have the, if, if we could, if we look at the Dow over the last 10 years, there's been a tripling of the value of the Dow. So there, there's COVID, as you can see, yep, but, yep. but it is generally an up, upward trend. And if you looked at the, as the standard and poor's index, that you would see a quadrupling of the Standard & Poor's Index in the very same period. On the next slide, we can see that, again, looking longer term, if you look at the Great Recession on the left and then the um, COVID on the right, um, these are manufacturers' new orders, non-defense orders. You see, again, tremendous upward movement um, in, in this fundamental measure of how the economy is doing. On the next slide, you can see that GDP growth, 10 years, 50% growth, nominal dollars, admittedly, doesn't account for inflation, but you see one dip in 2020, which was COVID very yep. quick. As we said in March, I believe March of 2020, uh, Brian, when we first got together on this topic, that you know, we said this, this is not an economic flaw. This is a public health crisis. Right. And this is going to come and go fairly quickly. And when we start to grow again, we'll grow again. So, so again, I think it's important to, to realize that these are, that the long-term trends here in the economy um, are what the long-term trends in the U.S. economy have been since its founding, which is growth, because that's, that's the way policies are structured in this country. If you look at the Wall Street Journal yesterday, yesterday, two days ago, two days ago, the time I think it was right. <laughs> who knows? But we, you know, we, we've got just under 6 million people looking for work and just over 11 million jobs open. So, so again, yes, we have immediate challenges in this economy that, that we can talk about and where they come from. But I think that it's important for the whole nonprofit sector to appreciate mm -hmm. the degree to which this particular ripple in the current, if you will, um, is within the context of major, major growth in economic value and, and asset value throughout the economy. So appreciate that, Susan, the, the, the context and the perspective, and if those were able to see the slides, uh, visually, you, you see what you're saying very well. Um, but you, the headlines are the headlines. I'm wondering what, what concerns might, you know, do you have about where we currently are? Right. 
So, so let me just take the two, the, I guess, the two pieces that, that are most in the headlines, and that is inflation and recession. We've had over the last four months, five months, um, some of the highest inflation rates that we've seen since, since the 70s. And the 70s were driven by the OPEP crisis, um, arguably poorly handled. Um, the projections are that inflation will come down to about five to 6% by the end of this year yep. and be back at two to 3% by the middle of third quarter of 2023. So inflation has been driven by the federal money driven into the economy. I mean, in, in, inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. That's mm -hmm. what it is. So we had a huge amount of money, trillions of dollars of money driven into the US economy, cash into the US economy during the pandemic. And obviously we had a reduction in Productive pro, pro, production in the mm -hmm. U.S. economy because of that disruption, and therefore you have an inflationary effect of all that cash. <clears throat> you have the 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 uh, supply chain problems that are linked to to the pandemic, but huge supply chain problems, and therefore again reduction in amount of goods, huge amount of cash into the economy, inflation to be expected. And then of course the third unexpected element was obviously the energy prices tied in part to the Ukraine problem in Ukraine and, and, and the Russian role in all of that. So you had these three drivers for inflation and, um, but those drivers will over time ease up. That cash will be spent yep. and there won't be any cash coming behind it. Um, the, the problem with the, the, the supply chain issue really is, you know, the, the globalization of the supply chain and getting some of that supply chain back on shore is a long term, a long term infrastructure problem. So it's going to take time. Um, and and the energy issue is the energy issue. Um, this morning's headlines, you know, with with OPEC starting to produce so that the president can go to Saudi Arabia um, uh, is, you know, is, is to get a policy solution. So, so what, what we have here on this side is, is a reality of inflation and, and the critical issue there is policy management. Okay. And the, the, biggest, the biggest concern is that policy management not drive the economy into what's called stagflation, which is what happened in the 70s, where inflation continues, but the way in which you are handling monetary policy or interest rates, if you will, um, stalls the economy. So you have inflation, you still have a lot of money and you have less and less production and, and you actually put fuel on the fire of inflation. And, and that's the real balancing act that Jay Powell and his his team are, you know, trying to avoid right now. Um, I have a lot of confidence in, in the Fed. Um, one of the great things that we have to understand about the Great Recession was that central bankers, the Fed, but central bankers generally around the world, learned a whole bunch during the Great Recession about how to manage monetary policy. Um, and so those learnings about how to fine tune, how to delicately move those dials, um, I think will, will serve public policy well over the next six months. Susan, you talked about um, the R word, recession. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if you could, because uh, I'm gonna, I would love, I wanna ask you about philanthropy in, in all this in a moment, but if you wouldn't mind saying a few words about a recession, you know, are we in one, are we heading in one? Um, what's your point of view on that right now? Well, you know, a recession is two, um, two quarters of uh, negative economic growth. That's the technical term. Right. But the National Bureau for Economic Research has over the last decade, developed a much more nuanced uh, set of indicators of what constitutes a recession. Lots of different factors that, that are in the algorithm. So it's, it's possible that, and, and everyone looks at the NBER as, a, as 
as the 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 lighthouse, if you will, of the declaration of a recession. So, given the the complex algorithm, it's possible that we will see a recession declared, you know, sometime in the next six months. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Recessions aren't necessarily bad things. They 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 help an economy re gear itself. Um, they drive out lack of productivity, they drive out firms that aren't successful, they move labor to more productive areas of an economy. So it's possible. I think that it's important to understand that this recession, given those growth rates, um, will, would likely be on the shorter side of things. An average recession is 10 months. Um, the Great Recession was the longest recession since the Second World War. Um, so it, even if it is declared, it is declared in the context of those first three charts that I put up, in the context of long-term growth, explosive growth in, in some ways over the last 10 years, um, and will be weathered, I think, very well um, by the economy, adjusted to very well by the economy. There are a couple of unknowns out there that could change that. Sure. Um, so, but but it will be weathered very well, I think, by this economy. Got it. And that this leads me to the question I uh, sort of highlighted a second ago, which is, I know you've done a lot of research over the years, written and spoken about philanthropy during a recessionary period, after, et cetera. Um, could you say a few words about, if, let's assume we are heading into one um, with the context that you just gave, how has philanthropy acted, for lack of a better word, in a time period like that? I mean, generally, um, in the if you look at the last year of a recession, and, and again, the, the philanthropic data it's, let me just say it's hard because the way in which the giving data are gathered are on an annual basis and recessions don't happen on an annual basis, they happen on a quarterly basis. So it's very difficult to line these two things up. But in general, the last year of a recession and the first year of the climb out, what you see in the first year of the climb out is that the percentage increase in philanthropy is higher than any percentage decrease in philanthropy in the recession. So, so you climb out, but you actually climb out faster and higher than you dipped in the recession. There are one or two exceptions to that. Um, the Great Recession was an exception to that. It okay. took three years of growth to make up for the amount of decline in the Great Recession. So, but, but again, that was, that was a structural flaw in the economy, as we said at the time. And the longest recession since the Second World War. So, so you can't really look at the Great Recession as, as, a, as, a, as, as your indicator of what's gonna right. happen. Right. But in general, the climb out at the end of a recession on giving is faster and higher than the fall during the recession. Got it. So from your point of view, and again, I'm making an assumption here, but if we're heading towards a recession, what does the, the, climb, back, the climb out, as you said, and which is faster than the downturn if it, if it did have one, what does that say to you in terms of how nonprofits from a strategy standpoint should be thinking about, should they be doing anything different? Should they be thinking about things differently? What, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think a couple of things. Um, I think that, again, part of the reason, and I know you don't do slides that much on Forging Forward, but part of the reason I wanted to put those slides up yep. was because a 10 month, let's say 10 months, I don't think it would be 10 months, but let's say 10 months, a 10 month recession in the context of the asset growth, right. the economic growth you saw in those slides means that the, the economy 
has more resources in it than by triple than it mm-hmm. had 10 years ago. So first of all, it's not going to mean, it shouldn't mean, you shouldn't interpret it as meaning <clears throat> that it is not going to be possible to generate resources for your nonprofit. Okay. So, so we, we have to change the narrative. Okay. From fat, from fear to facts, mm. right. There will be fear. There will be, you know, this going on. Yep. It's really up to the nonprofit sector to, and I don't know, Brian, how many times I've said this, probably too many times. I'm getting tired of hearing myself say it. <laughs> the nonprofit sector has got to master economic analysis. It simply has to understand how these things work in order to drive its own narrative in an economic downturn. All right, so, so number one, remember those first two charts. Mm-hmm. First three charts. Number two, it is... There is no campaign that that I'm aware of, maybe you know of one, that's 10 months long. Yeah, no. So so these are multi-year efforts. And a recession will take place, yes. If a recession takes place, yes. But it doesn't mean you should stop anything because this this is irrational to stop anything given the the difference in the timeframe. However, it is also important to understand that any recession, depending on its cause, whether it's whether it is an unexpected emergent public health emergency like COVID, or a, a war, it it, um, it affects the economy differently. It affects industries differently. Mm-hmm. So that the most one of the most important things that a, a nonprofit needs to do is look at its leadership, look at its board, look at its donors from that perspective. Do you should have the same kind of human resources balance in your nonprofit that you have in your financial portfolio? You know, your board shouldn't be made up of, of all real estate. People are or all manufacturing people are all tech people. You should have that kind of balance so that when a recession affects a particular industry, particularly in a particular with a particular intensity, there's balance in everything else. You should know that about your donors. You should know that about your board. You should know that about your volunteers. That should be part of the profile, not just how many houses do they own and how many boats do they own, but what industry are they involved in so that you can have that kind of diversity in your human resources portfolio the same way you have in your financial portfolio. Uh, That's great. Yeah, it's so true. So well said. Uh, You know, one of the the 08 or 09 um, crisis that we had, the financial crisis that we had, I remember talking to you about that very topic because we had a few clients at the time who were leaning in one industry very, very heavily. Uh, it happened to be the financial industry, which was which was you know, hit relatively hard in that. To your exact point, and and I mean, almost darn near wiped out the whole board. I mean, from a because they they all they had to go attend to their own other matters, and it, it helped. I remember the one client we had. It, it really drove them to a standstill because they were they were, and and I remember when I started working with this client. And I, and I get it. And they were, they were in a sense, boastful that their board was made up of so many financial people, you know, and there's other ways, you know, as well to engage people that, that is not necessarily a board seat. So if you have a lot of, I mean, great, figure out other ways, but, but that I think you're well, the, those that are driving the, the boat, if you will, the board members with the leadership of the nonprofit, that diversity angle and, and even understanding it. I mean, first understand it in order to make sure you have the diversity. Uh, something I was talking to a client last week about, even about, they, this particular client has six new board slots opening up. So they're going to have a whole new class coming on and looking at it from a, what, what skills do we have now? What skills do we need? Never, you know? Um, yeah. It's I think a really important lesson as well. Um, Susan, my last question is sort of, sort of going off, off script a little here, just from the standpoint of where we've been about the economy and what's happening. And, and it's because I'm, I'm also very intrigued about something else I know you've talked about over the last few years um, which I'll 
try to say is what's the difference between what I'll call traditional philanthropy and, and people moving or, or participating in, in societal problem solving in, in other ways with other assets, whether that be a company or whatever the case might be. And, and so I would love to hear you just in general, your thoughts on that. Secondarily, the psychological nature of, of the way I describe it to some people now is, you know, writing the old fashioned check, checkbook philanthropy, traditional philanthropy is a way. Not, it seems to me becoming in a very uh, crowded, I think in a good way, crowded way in which people can participate in, in, in the not-for-profit and social impact sector. So just would love to hear your thoughts on that as, as a way to sort of round out this conversation, because I think it's also something for those listening today or watching after, I think something for them, in addition to the point you made about diversifying your board, for instance, to begin to think about their own organizations through this lens. Yeah, no, and again, we've talked about this you know, in the past, and I've done some writing about this. Um, I think that, I think that, I know that there's, you know, there's data out there that says the overall number of donors has declined, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, part of the problem, again, part of the problem with the way we collect data in this sector is that we look at money as behavior, right? And so, and then we want to be, we want to be able to compare over 50 years. And so we have to have consistent measures of money as behavior. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's great. And I'm all about data consistency. The problem is when reality starts to delaminate from that, you have consistent data but declining validity <laughs> because, because the reality has begun to delaminate from that measure. And I think that's where we have been and where we are going over the next period of time. Is it true that the number of donors is down by 5.7%? Yes. Is it true that engagement in societal problem solving is down by 5.7%? Probably not because, because, the opportunities to engage in problem solving are infinitely more varied today than they were 50 years ago or 20, even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. How you consume is a, is a measure in many people's minds, how they consume is a measure of their commitment to problem solving, not how they donate. Right. That I put, that I spent $20,000 putting solar panels on my home, but didn't give to the World Wildlife Fund, doesn't, it makes me an environmentalist in my view. It makes me committed to the environment in my view. That I biased my portfolio toward, you know, toward environmentally responsible companies. How I invest is a function of my commitment. Those investments in my view are my commitment to the, to the environment, not the check I made out for 10 bucks, you know, to the, to the Seacoast nonprofit. Right. So how I consume how I invest and how I behave is in my view, what I am doing for society, for the globe, for global warming, okay? Yep. That I recycle, that I only buy natural fabrics, that I on and on and on. How I behave is my commitment. Yep. So the question then becomes, but how I behave, how I behave right. is not going to turn on the nonprofit's lights or pay their utility bill, okay? So this delamination, all right, between how I look at this and how the nonprofit sector needs to pay the bills, <laughs> you know, are, are two different things. And, and so I think... We don't, and we need in the nonprofit sector, first of all, to understand behavior. 
And to understand behavior, you have to understand psychology. So we need to understand people just the way corporate people understand their customers. They understand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, how many parking spaces away from the, <laughs> from the store you park, you know, and then yep. they'll figure out how, how those that decision about how you park will have something to do with, you know, how you behave. So we have to understand the psychology and behavior, not of check writing, but of all of the other things to drive people to commitment to the societal commons, to the global commons, to their communities. Yep. yep. That, that is the most important information that has that it that is input to strategy about their wallet. But it's also, Brian, input to strategy about how nonprofits themselves behave. All right. So you, the nonprofit, have to behave in a way that that aligns, that resonates with my consumption, my investment, my behavior. Are you going paperless? Do you have social so, solar panels on your building? Have you committed to zero carbon footprint? I mean, on and on and on. Do you make vaccinations available yep. to, to your people? I mean, people are looking for consistency. And when they see consistency that resonates with the way they behave, then you can talk to them about their wallets. Yep. Don't try to talk to them about their wallets before you do that. Well said. Well said. And I was hopeful, I think, that you would give that perspective as a way of even rounding out this conversation, because I think it's something really important for nonprofits in, in good times, financial and in, in challenging times. This is, this is, this is something, I, and you said it, and I 100% agree. This is not going. This is this is not going away. This way, the way that people you know behave, shop, consume, and I think it's a it's a wake up in many regards. I think for the nonprofit community to 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 be aware of it, as you said earlier, to understand the data behind some of this, the the patterns, the behaviors, so that they can better position themselves, their their causes, their needs to keep the lights on and to do the great work that they all do. So exactly, and and I think you know younger generations, younger donors, even in a recession that what's going to change will be maybe their giving, all right? Because they see that as out of excess resources, mm -hmm. okay? But what will not change is their behavior with regard to what they'd see as necessary resources, necessary expenditures. So it's really important for you to be seen in their necessary resource mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not in their excess resource behavior. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well said. Well, well, that'll do it for, for Forging Forward 75 as we're trending, keeping going north here to our 100th, 100th show where we're getting closer and closer. Thank you uh, to Dr. Susan Raymond for leading us in this conversation about the current economy and its impact on the philanthropic sector. Thank you to all of those who uh, are, are with us live and or watching this after the effect. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, for myself or, or Susan, about anything we covered, please feel free to reach out. But thank you again. And Susan, any final comments, any thoughts you want to leave the audience with? No, great to be here, Brian. Good to see you again. Right. Likewise. Thank you. Good to see you as always. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the day and have a great weekend. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks again.